In our third segment, I want to make a few observations about some of the false assumptions. They're, very, they're not too often brought up, but recently there has been a great deal of discussion in connection with Suborum Pontificum, the attempt, as it were, to bring the ordinary and extraordinary forms of the forms of the mass, a mass that as we knew it before the council and that which came with the renewal into sharper, sharper relations with one another so that there's really only one Latin rite, whether you do it in this form or that form or another form. Just as obviously before the council, anyone who went to a solemn high mass, for instance, celebrated by the Pope, and uh, the very simple uh, private mass of a religious priest on a side altar in the chapel of his, uh, chapel of his monastery, it didn't look the same. Uh, all you have to do uh, is the first obvious thing that the private mass in the, in, in, in the chapel probably didn't take more than 25 or 30 minutes, maximum, maximum. And you went to the solemn pontifical of the Pope and you were there for five, or five hours at least, maybe more, depending on how fast the Pope went. You had Greek and Latin and all the, all the rest processions here, there, and elsewhere. El, 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 it was wonderful, wonderful. But no one would say that uh, we, should, uh, we should celebrate the, uh, the extraordinary form, the solemn pontifical, as it were, 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 were every day. Every day, right? You would you would never get anything else done. That's our Lord's intention. On the other hand, no one would would deny that it's the extraordinary form, which is uh, is the model, the exemplar for all the forms which are abbrevi abbreviated. Uh, and so what we want to say is, what are the false assumptions that lead people to draw conclusions from documents, but when the documents don't su uh, su uh, support them? And one of the major ones ones is precisely this: they will say both sides that are, for one reason or another, critical of the council, refuse to accept it as it is and not as they want it to be, be, all maintain that you can't separate the historical, human, almost sometimes, some instance, heretical element from the work, the work produced by the council. The influence of the so-called dissenting experts, those influenced by Kant and Hegel and all of the, uh, all of the rest, uh, we shan't name any names here, uh, here is we're not, uh, not the purpose to attack, attack people, are so bound up with the, uh, with the council that they cannot be separated from the texts themselves. You admit that these people were there, that they had uh, ideas which were not in accord, accord with the teaching of Christ, right? therefore, you see, we caught you, caught you. You can't get away from it. It's the council that is responsible for the breakdown of the church, the crisis in the church afterward, not this or that indiv indiv individual, individual. This is the first thing. Secondly, it's difficult to explain how anything of this kind could have happened and be prepared for in the mere three years between the death of, uh, of uh, Pi Pius XII and, uh, uh, and uh, practically the beginning of the council in 1962 three and a half, half to four, uh, four, 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 four years. And therefore, they're point the same thing happened. Already was happening in the pontificate of Pius XII. Well, that advisors, et cetera, were not only opposed to the traditional approaches there, but that had already penetrated the actual teaching documents of the Pope. For instance, Divino Aflante Spirito, on the sacred scripture, the use of literary forms. For the traditionalists, the use of literary forms is basically, uh, basically a sign that you're off the deep, uh, deep end. The admission of certain forms of ecumenism, etc., et the toleration of participation, of participation in the, uh, the, the, uh, the congresses sponsored by the World Council of Churches, that's already opening the door to the world. Well, we see that even today, uh, uh, in, uh, in recent, recent months, this idea coming to the fore, the biblical renewal, the scriptural renew, uh, re, re, renewal, the ecumenical mo movement, and basically, as it were, the consideration of the historical element in, in, uh, in theological reflection, all these things open to the world, to the conversion of the church to the world. And thus we have, as it were, a certain, a certain effusion of the merely human with the divine, which therefore brings down the divine merely to the level of another group of, uh, of, uh, of, of opinion. 
philosophy of, uh, of, 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 of religion. This can take various forms. Forms. Uh, you know, they talk about the the Alicantu is an event, yeah. and, and therefore, as it were, it's it, the history and all the activity of the various persons, orthodox, heterodox, or what, 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 are so bound up that you can't separate them out. You have to deal with it as it is, is and as it is studied in that fashion, it obviously, as it were, where it can be said to involve some kind of rupture. And this is what the Holy Father denies, because you cannot reduce a council solemnly proclaimed as such, approved in that, in that fashion, even if it doesn't have one solemn dogma to that, that level. The second is, as the, the use, overuse of the term pastoral, of course it's a pastoral council, but it doesn't mean that pastoral advice, and particularly that doctrinal perspective, which is the essential, essential unique contribution, you might say, uh, even before we begin to study dogmas and disciplinary reg regulations, we have to have some vision of what the theology is all about in the first place. In what context does this, uh, does this fit? There is nothing particularly wrong. Read St. Bonaventure, how he gives you a s synthetic view of the whole in which he begins to explain that. He doesn't relativize them. He just makes it easy for us to understand, not only theoretically, but above all in a practical way. How does it apply? Not only in moral theology, but above all in spiritual theology, in the prime work that we have to do for which we're given theology. So in this sense, what Vatican II is trying to do, and this is the Pope's understanding, is to present a vision. Vision. It's the traditional vision, but a vision so formulated and so, so pre presented, presented that we can understand at the present time what we must do to sanctify our souls and to draw others as it were to understand, to resolve the major problems, which are real problems, not simply invented to persecute the church or to deceive the, uh, the members of the, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of, of the of the uh, of the church. An interesting way of looking at it, uh, everybody's familiar with the way laws are made in modern republics. Now, not all the laws are good laws, but everyone knows that there is a difference between studying those laws only in terms of the arguments and disputes in Congress, uh, uh, Congress and the law itself. You can't appeal to the, uh, what your representative said or somebody else's representative said against it to win a case. You have to appeal to the law, what it actually me uh, means ob uh, objectively. And the same is true with any council. The same is true with any encyclical of a, of a, of a, of a pope. Well, these are official documents. These are documents which uh, enjoy a certain guidance of the Holy Spirit, not always involving dogmatic definitions that cannot be uh, reform reformulated, but nonetheless providing sure guidance. To deny that point, to say that we must call all these things into question before we can accept Vatican, uh, uh, Vatican, uh, Vatican II is to say we don't really believe it's an ecumenical council. It's only another theological document which you can which you can pull apart in one way one way or one way or another according to what I like the past or what you like the the future. Let me examine it carefully. We see, as we were, which you'll see in a moment, that the present pope doesn't share these the approaches, that he is indeed, as it were, point by point, and especially the major points that are being questioned, questioned they're saying these were innovative, or most of what we can accept, but what they are the key points. If you don't accept them, you don't accept the council. council. Now, you're saying, in effect, it should be abolished from the face of the uh, from the face of the earth, and so we, what we want to look at is now: Is the Holy Father, also his prayer, but especially Benedict the Sixteenth, who was an expert there, who is certainly one of the leading theologians, the leading theological lights of our, our time? What is he saying about Pius the Twelfth? What is he saying about uh, about the, uh, the Council? What hap hap happened there? About uh, these key points that seemingly betrayed the tr uh, tradition. And then we shall have a better understanding of what a blessing this council is.